With more than 6,000 small and micro-cap companies listed, if you're looking for the next Apple, at the earliest stage, then Channel Check truly is the orchard. The listed companies support Channel Check, so it's free for you, the potential investor, to gain access to institutional quality research from FINRA licensed analysts, advanced market data, industry reports, news, and a growing catalog of videos and webcasts. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and register for Channel Check so you're always up to date on what's going on at the small and microcap data place. Welcome to New Methods in Pain Management, a NobleCon online investor event presented by Channel Check and Noble Capital Markets. Noble is an SEC-registered, FINRA-licensed broker-dealer and the source of the equity research available on Channel Check. This presentation features Bioelectronics Corporation, OTC ticker symbol BIEL, following a brief overview presentation from VP of Product Development Shri Kanaru, Noble Research Analyst Gregory Arand will moderate a Q&A session. With that, I am pleased to present Shri Kanaru. Hey everybody, my name is Sri. I'm a biomedical engineer by training and I lead product development for a company called Bioelectronics. In this presentation today, I'd like to walk you through what the general technology platform for our company is and how it fits a unique need in the marketplace for musculoskeletal pain as well as post-operative pain. In order to do that, first I'd like you to walk through our general understanding of the difference between acute pain and chronic pain. The classic definition for acute pain and chronic pain used to be that if you've had the pain for a short time, that it's acute in nature, but if you've had it for an extended period of time, that it's chronic in nature. And that's how we classically differentiated it. However, over the last 10 years or so, our understanding of that has changed. And before we approach that, I'd like to walk you through how pain is even um, transmitted from the point of injury to your brain where it's perceived as pain and what some common over-the-counter approaches do to address this. So if you look at the figure on your left-hand side, you can see there's three separate nerve fibers called A beta, A delta, C fibers, etc. But the general concept is that there's uh, nerves that are sensitive to mechanical stimulus, there's nerves that are sensitive to light stimulus, and then there's a lot of uh, nerves that are stimulus to painful stimulus. And when there's a source of injury, for example, let's say um, a, a trauma, like a force, or let's say a burning sensation, or any other kind of injury, then your pain fibers pick up these signals, which then goes to the brain. Now, there's three categories of these types of pain. One is what we call nociceptive pain. This happens when, let's say, you have a cut on your hand or you burned your hand, things of that nature. The second is neuropathic pain. This happens when there's damage to your nerves itself, resulting from, let's say, surgical incision, where you actually have to cut through tissue and the nerves get severed. That pain that is happening as a result of the severed nerve is called neuropathic pain. And then the third pain, um, which I'm not going to cover here today, but it's inflammatory pain, or rather caused by inflammation. We've already discussed the temporal classification of it. And now that we've addressed the different types of pain, look, let's look at what type of OTC approaches are commonly used, which is on the right-hand side. So the most common method of trying to treat acute pain or short-acting pain is things like topical masking technologies. What I mean by that, by that is things like creams, for example, topical ointments like Biofreeze, Bengay, or any other ointments. The second category, or rather this, the second type in this category is uh, heat strips or any heating pads. What these serve to do is they ask as a masking mechanism where they try to block the existing source of pain for as long as you're using it, and as soon as you stop using it, the pain comes back on. The analogy is if you hit your hand against the wall, you rub on it to make the pain go away, but when you stop, it comes back. So that's what these do. The second category is oral analgesics, things like ibuprofen, um, acetaminophen, aspirin, th things of that nature. And these serve to essentially block pain signals from coming at the nerve fiber into the brain. And these work to a good degree. However, not all pain types uh, have an underlying injury associated with it, and that's something I'm going to cover in the next slide. The third category is something we call passive support technologies, which is things like taping it up um, or wearing braces. And what these serve to do is they prevent the injured limb from moving so as you're not exacerbating the injury further. So in the next slide, I'd like to cover the definition of what is chronic pain. So again, we've covered that acute pains are typically classified as those that heal in a short span of time, which is typically three months or less. However, when 
this acute pain does not go away for a while and it transitions to chronic pain, which is pain that you've had a long time. And when then there's no underlying source of injury, this is being referred to as chronic pain. And let me explain to you what I mean by that. Let's take the classic example of arthritis. So for example, knee osteoarthritis or plantar fasciitis, things of that nature. Now, these are pain conditions. You would imagine that the amount of pain a person feels should be related to the amount of injury that, that's present. But if you ask any physician, they'll tell you that if you do a radiological image, the amount of damage you see on the knee is not always related to the amount of pain you feel. So something other is happening. Something other than the simple injury leads to pain mechanism is happening here. Well, turns out it's a phenomenon called central sensitization. But basically, this happens because your nerves in the region have become hyperactive. What, what I mean by this is think of your painful nerves as uh, an agitated toddler. Over time, if, if they happen to forget why they were agitated, the pain goes away. But if not, they become incre increasingly sensitized so that small triggers can set them off. So people with this chronic pain are often have, have become stuck in a pain state. And so using over-the-counter treatment approaches gives them some relief, but it doesn't address the underlying condition. And things like inflammation reduction, for example, they provide some relief, but you have to remember, it's not active inflammation that's causing the pain. Your nerves have actually learned it over time. And so our approach towards treating this chronic pain or even post-operative pain that has been left over time is we'd like to treat the underlying nerve hypersensitivity and then use that as a mechanism to address the underlying cause which manifests as pain relief. So how can we do that other than the technologies that we've discussed before? So let me introduce you a term called electroceuticals. In a broad sense, electroceuticals means any modality that uses electrical signals to provide a therapeutic benefit. So in this sense, something like a pacemaker is an electroceutical. Um, but for the context of pain relief, I'd like to categorize them into either invasive options or non-invasive options. So let's cycle through the invasive options first and quickly. So there's things like acupuncture or percutaneous stimulation. What they try to do is they try to access your nerves by puncturing the skin and transcutaneously accessing the specific nerves. The second category is where you would actually need to implant a signal generator that can stimulate your nerves. So think of a spinal cord stimulator or a pacemaker or a deep brain stimulator, a cochlear implant, you get the idea. So obviously these are not available to everybody for uh, practical reasons in that there's a risk of surgery and then the high cost associated with surgery. Non-invasive options tend to be much more attractive for the consumer healthcare market. And within these, there's two categories, whether it touches your skin or it doesn't. And that's what we call contact-based or contactless based. So contact-based technologies are what we refer to as TENS technologies. You may have seen uh, Shaq O'Neill's um, Icy Hot TENS machine a couple of years ago. But what that serves to do is it uses your skin to send electricity across it and tries to uh, affect the behavior of the underlying nerves in the region. And that works to some extent. The next category is called contactless um, technologies, which use electromagnetic waves, sort of like your inductive charger, your phone's wireless charger, where you don't have to keep touching it, you can still transmit it. So that's the concept behind that. And then the next couple of slides, I'd like to walk you through the differences between the two technologies and what are some of the advantages offered by contactless electroceuticals. All right, so let's talk about the contact electroceuticals first. Don't get me wrong, contact electroceuticals have been the mainstay of uh, this, this kind of therapies and, and they work really well. However, there's some challenges that prevent it from being used for or rather by everybody. So for example, in a recent survey, we found that 20% of those who were in chronic pain already used TENS devices, but it worked only very limitedly for them because of some of the side effects they were experiencing. For example, many times it requires custom settings in that not the same frequencies or amplitudes or strengths work for everybody. So sometimes it takes a little bit of investigation to find out what custom setting would work for you. And this can cost additional resources if you require uh, people like a clinician to train you. The second is there's the risk of something called paresthesia, which is the tingling, burning sensation, such as, such as when you discharge a static, static shock, you know, in the winter or, or when you have your coat and then you touch a doorknob. And typically, this technology shouldn't be used for more than 20 or 30 minutes at a time, because as you can see in the figure on the right-hand bottom, it can sometimes lead to skin burning or damage. And so the duration is limited. And lastly, this cannot be used directly over bandaging or any incisions, so that kind of negates the whole 
surgical market or people with fractures or people with fragile skin. You get the idea. And this is where contactless electroceuticals have a clear advantage. So let me explain the principle behind contactless electroceuticals. On the left hand side, on the top hand side, you see something that looks like a coil. Essentially, it's, it's like a little loop. What we do is we produce electrical currents in that loop and these generate electromagnetic fields which can pass through space. For example, it's like your, again, like your phone's wireless charger. It can pass through thin barriers like paper, clothing, light skin, things of that nature. And so what contactless electroceuticals serve to do is they can pass through the barrier of skin and fat and they can create the current in the tissue right where it matters. And the advantages of using contactless electroceuticals is you can keep the power level low enough so that you don't actually feel anything when you're using them. And so for that reason, for that reason, it can be used over extended periods. We're talking about 24 hours a day for as long as you need to. And this is also ideal for targeting nerves that are deeper in the body. For example, things like tense machines, like we've seen in the previous slide, they can penetrate a few centimeters into the body, but contactless electrocyticals can actually be targeted for specific nerve fibers in the body if you choose to. For example, things like in the lower back, or um, anything in the upper extremities that typically can be penetrated by tents. So where does this bring bioelectronics as technology? So we have what we build an ideal electromagnetic electrocytical, a contactless electrocytical, which is, as you can see, the figure on the right-hand side, the bottom right-hand side, that's, that's our, that's our uh, flagship technology. The size is about the size of your um, pump, so about 100 square centimeters. So the treatment area, let me walk you through the, what, the, what the concept here is, and then I'll walk you through some of the technical, uh, technical characteristics. But the device really has two simple elements. One, there's basically a module, as you can see, with a battery, uh, with an on-off switch, and that tells you where the device comes on or off. The second is there's an antenna, and in the middle is where the therapeutic loop is. So the treatment area is actually not underneath this module, but it's actually within the loop. Um, so I'll almost just like your wireless charger, it's actually in the center, not on the edges. So this is where the therapeutic um, effectiveness is. So let's say you were to have knee pain, you would place your knee at, within this loop of the device. So let's look at some of the technical characteristics. W what does this device actually look like if, uh, if you look at the technical characteristics? Well, the signal looks very much like the signal on top. Basically what's going on, a field that's oscillating at 27 million times a second, 27 megahertz, this signal is then turned on and off 1,000 times a second, which we call the pulse repetition interval. And each of these pulses lasts about 100 microseconds long, or a tenth of a millisecond, basically. And the power level is about 70 microwatts per square centimeters. What does this mean? So the power level, just to put it into context, is about 200 times lower than what you would need to actually warm tissue. So we're well below what we call the thermal threshold. And importantly, this technology is recognized by the FDA and we've actually received multiple clearances on this technology. So let me walk you through how this technology can help with the chronic pain that we've discussed early on the slides. All right, so how can this technology actually help reduce that nerve hypersensitivity or central sensitization that we've spoken about? So let's think of an analogy again. So let's think of our chronic pain as this agitated toddler who is just hyperreactive to a lot of different types of stimuli. So the idea is that if you give the toddler something to do and play with for a safe, that is safe, and that they can do it for an extended period of time, the idea is that over time, they tend to forget why they were hyperreactive in the first place. And that's what we're trying to do with our technology. We're not trying to cure the underlying condition. What we're trying to do is give your hypersensitized nerves a new sense of information that they cannot hyperreact to. And over time, what that happens is over time, your pain threshold, which has been lowered, because now you, you can um, react to low types of pain, we're kind of raising it over time back to your normal threshold level, which manifests as pain relief. So let's say you have a pain that's about a 7 or an 8 out of a 10, where 0 is bad, very low and 10 is very bad. So we're trying to take your pain from 7 or 8 to maybe a more manageable 2.5 or 3, so that you can get back and improve functionality. And the advantage of this technology is that it has a pulsed signal, as I described earlier, which means that your body doesn't adapt to it. So you can actually use it 24 hours a day when you're actually sleeping to recover at night, or if you want to slip it into some sort of a um, 
like a brace or some sort of a sleeve and then wear it on or tape it on as part of your active lifestyle. So this is very well suited for that. Now we've spoken about the musculoskeletal pain management segment. I'd like you to also introduce you to our post-operative pain management segment. Um, the trade name for that is called the recovery RX, but the premise is very similar. So the current approach to uh, managing post-operative pain is that following surgery, patients are given a cocktail of analgesics, some of which have opioids, but they commonly also have acetaminophen and NSAIDs. And the idea is that they would like to block the pain as much as possible and tamp down the inflammation as much as possible because maintaining low pain postoperatively is very indicative of a high chance of success later on. However, when you look at literature, oftentimes nearly half of patients report that their relief is inadequate and they just can't keep getting more and more opioid-based um, pills or any other sort of pain management uh, interventions like pharmacologics because they tend to have their own adverse effects. And so the key to enhancing the effectiveness of overall therapy um, is to introduce a multimodal concept. And what we mean by that is post-operative pain is very complex, so you can't just address it using one intervention. So what we recommend is going after a cocktail of pharmacological interventions and what we call physical medicine. And the idea is that this technology will serve as the physical medicine portion of the multimodal therapy and help with overall pain management. So Recovery Rx, which is what the same technology is, is a non-pharmacological intervention for post-operative pain management. So the key here is that recovery, and the picture on the bottom here is an example of a patient who just went uh, underwent uh, knee replacement. Um, we obviously had to Photoshop the device on because the original angle wasn't very nice. So we had to actually make sure to put this on to provide a better sense of how this uh, device can be used. But what uh, surgeons typically do is once they've bandaged um, the incision, they place the device right on top over the dressing because remember, the device can actually penetrate through dressing and then they just wrap it up. The idea is that this device can enhance um, the amount of pain relief following surgery without having to rely excessively on opioids. And it also reduces the nerve hypersensitivity in the treatment area. And as a result, it should significantly lower the risk of developing chronic post-operative pain. Um, so the benefits, some of them have listed on the site, but what we found in our randomized double-blended trials is that it can actually reduce pain as well as reduce pain medication use. So some of the questions we commonly get asked is, does this technology interact with medical implants? Um, and so let me walk you quickly through what this power look, level looks like and how, what kind of depth does the signal actually penetrate? So if you look at the left-hand side portion of the slide, if you see the figure, the x-axis states um, the depth measurements that we did in a phantom tissue. Uh, the phantom tissue in this case happened to be a slab of saline gel, which has very similar electrical properties to that of tissue. And the y-axis is the intensity of the magnetic field that we measured these successive layers. So what we were able to find is that at about a depth of five centimeters or so, about at least 50% or more of this incoming field is still retained. And so the effective penetration depth is at least five centimeters or more, which is pretty deep in the body. The FDA views this technology as a class two medical device that uses radio frequencies. However, the power levels being so low, um, they, compare, they compare it to am, ambient RF, like let's say, let's say uh, wireless signals or, or, or other things that we're currently surrounded with. And as a result, it's incapable of heating tissue. So how does this translate to use over implantables? So the rule to remember is that it is safe to use over all metallic implants as long as they're not active. You can use this directly, for example, over knee replacements, over hip replacements, shoulder replacements, etc. It won't cause any heating or interference with the implant, so it can be used. With regards to electronic implants, let's say like insulin pumps or spinal cord simulators or pacemakers, the device can still be used. However, just out of an abundance of caution, we recommend not to use directly over the area. So let's say if you have um, a pacemaker installed, you can use it over your shoulders, just not directly over the incision, just again, out of an abundance of caution. Because as an engineer, our understanding of this technology is that Implantables are designed to be able to shield itself from radio frequency interference. So there is really, uh, isn't really a concern about that. So in terms of the company's um, position on what kind of regulatory clearances we have. So within the United States, we actually have general clearance for use in the treatment of musculoskeletal pain. 
As a class two device in this category of electromagnetic stimulation, we are the only technology that's been cleared by the FDA um, for both musculoskeletal pain and post-operative pain. And we actually had to do a number of randomized double-blended trials, which I didn't use in this slide set uh, just for the sake of brevity, um, but we're happy to provide that information. But we've, been, we've done three randomized double-blended trials uh, for musculoskeletal pain and two randomized double-blended trials that have been published for post-operative pain. With regards for the rest of the world, the device is also CE cleared or approved and has a CE mark as a class two device. And it has broad applications for the treatment of soft tissue pain. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty a wide open gallery as to what indications can be pursued. And it's also listed for reimbursement on the United King, Kingdom's NHS drug tariff in that um, the government will actually pay for it if the provider finds that this technology will be helping their patients in lieu of taking pain medication. So the exciting thing about this technology is that it can be leveraged further to develop products for non-painful disorders as well. If you remember, the mechanism of action that we've been pursuing is that we want to mitigate the underlying sensitization as a way to treat the syndrome called pain. However, pain is just one of the syndromes affected by central sensitization. Here are some examples of neurological disorders that can be targeted. So musculoskeletal pain, post-operative pain, we've already covered those, which are in the top left and bottom right corner, respectively. But things like overactive bladder, migraine, peripheral neuropathy, chronic wounds, pelvic pain, and menstrual pain. These are some examples of neurological disorders that don't have a great amount of sensitivity to pharmacological drugs. However, they are excellent sites for implementing electroceuticals as a way of doing product development. So the company obviously has a bright future um, in terms of being able to develop these uh, uh, flagship product line. So in summary, I'd like to just go ahead with uh, reiterating the definitions of chronic pain versus acute pain. Remember that acute pain and chronic pain are, are classic terms for time-based view of how often you've had the pain. But in reality, your pain can turn chronic as soon as your nerves have been sensitized. So this can happen over a matter of hours, it can happen over a matter of weeks, it can ha happen over a matter of months. But essentially, once your nerves have been sensitized and your pain thresholds have been lowered, you are now stuck in this chronic pain state. And existing treatments such as over-the-counter products, they target these symptoms, but not the underlying cause. Electrocyticals are unique in that they can target the underlying cause. So that is, they can mitigate some of the sensitization and then they can actually provide meaningful pain relief by permanently or semi-permanently raising your pain threshold. So ActiPatch is an ideal electrocytical that is well suited for musculoskeletal pain management. The Recovery RX is ideal for post-operative pain management. And both technologies have a demonstrated marketability. They're currently being marketed in the US and a couple of countries around the world. In fact, we've been um, partnering with a number of channel partners, major channel partners who actually want to take this to retail as an over-the-counter device. And we have some confirmed sales plans. So this rounds up uh, the technology uh, portfolio of it. And now I'd like to request and Greg to um, quiz me with some questions so we can try to get to know the product better. Shree, thank you so much for that presentation. That was well done. I appreciate uh, what you have contributed uh, to the effort of bioelectronics. Uh, I do have some questions, uh, as you suggested, uh, uh, regarding the, the product and, it, and how, it, how it works. Um, you gave a really good perspective on um, pulse shortwave therapy, but can you explain mm -hmm. how ActivePatch actually was developed and a little bit more about the technology behind it? Sure, Greg, um, that, that's a great question. So although the product itself is unique and cutting edge, the technology behind it is almost 100 years old. Um, so it's not anything uh, experimental in nature. So the premise behind this technology is basically radar. So back in the 1940s when um, uh, the Navy was testing out radar, they noticed that at certain low levels, there could be some effects, biological effects in humans. And so this pulsing action of shortwave therapy was done as a way to reduce the power level. So back then, instead of having a regulator like you would down in your fan, pulsing is a way to control the power level. That's how pulsing was introduced. And so when the power level became very low, despite the lack of heating, there were all these um, um, therapeutic benefits being reported, pain relief and improved blood flow and a whole gamut of things. But the industry and the scientific community didn't take it very seriously because, well, it, it could do anything, right? And so what ended up happening is these were large clunky machines 
But with the advent of uh, microelectronics and things of that nature, over the last 10 or 20 years, we've been able to shrink this technology down and definitively, definitively work on the clinical evidence to understand what's the mechanism of action, is there enough evidence to suggest that it's safe and that it's effective, and that's what led to the development of ActiPatch. Interesting background, indeed. Um, you mentioned also that it's pretty safe for people to wear. Uh, there's not a great amount of interaction with other devices, but there are there limitations to either ActiPatch or Recovery RX? Good question, Greg. So. I'm more concerned about what other devices can do to ActiPatch and Recovery RX as opposed to the other way around, just because how little devices they are. So any wearable devices uh, that are approved by the FDA that put out a signal, they have to go through a battery of tests called electrical safety and electromagnetic compatibility. I won't bore you with the details, but the general premise is that it wouldn't electrocute you, um, that it shouldn't interfere with your equipment in your home, and vice versa, those shouldn't be affecting you. I mean, now, if you go take and put this device next to a ham radio, this device will stop working because it's just going to interfere, right? I mean, just like putting your cell phone in the microwave. Um, but these technologies are incapable of interfering with most other technologies. The reason we ask people with implantables to be cautious is sort of like testing sort of interventions on some populations, for example, um, children or pregnant women. We don't have any reason to assume that it would be unsafe, but it would be unethical for us to test in that population. So just out of an abundance of caution, we recommend that patients use this device a little away from their implant. But most implants are designed to shield these kinds of radio frequencies, not just ours, any kind of ambient radio frequencies. Yeah, interesting indeed. Uh, can a patient wear multiple devices at the same time? Say they had uh, knee surgery, uh, but they also had an old traumatic shoulder injury uh, or other things going on in their body at the same time. Is, is it possible to do that? Absolutely, uh, Greg. So from a, therape from a therapeutic standpoint, you can use as many devices as you like. So from a technical standpoint, the only thing we'd recommend not to do is place two devices on top of each other. The reason being no nothing to do with safety, but think of these as um, two sound emitting, like speakers, right? As long as the speakers are playing the same sound, they're going to create more volume. But if they're playing exactly out of sync with each other, they'll cancel each other and you won't really get the benefits. So they're okay to lay right next to each other in different parts of the body. Just You just shouldn't stack them on top of each other because you might end up getting no benefit. That's great, that's great news. Um, you, you said they can be worn for a long period of time. How long does actually the product last? It's got a battery in it, right? So you know, what, what do you have to do in terms of replacing either the battery or the device? So great question, Greg. So the, the device is designed to operate, at least the flagship product is designed to operate for 720 hours. What that translates to is if you use it for, if you use it continuously, it'll last you more than a month. But if you use it, let's say initially for 24 hours a day to get a sense of, is it working for me, right? Because there's no sensation. Then after a couple of days, you can switch it to overnight use, which means you can get up to three months out of use out of it. The reason we've come up with a disposable version of the device is because there's much more stringent regulations if patients are able to operate and take batteries out and, and things of that nature because FDA wants to make sure that there's no infection issues or there's any safety issues and things of that nature. Plus, we wanted to make it a very wearable, lightweight device. And so for those reasons, we came up with a design to have a low-cost, wearable, disposable type of pain management device. Uh, you mentioned that there's uh, ability to work ActiPatch or Recovery RX into a multimodal um, application. Uh, for pain treatment, um, are there any in medications you or other therapies you can't work with in, at the same time? Uh, great question, Greg. No, uh, there isn't any interactions with other medications. In fact, in all our clinical trials that we do with the FDA, um, they want to. First of all, it's unethical to have a control group that uses no medication, right? I mean, you don't want to prevent people from having access to their existing medication. And so, when we do these trials. There's a group that gets an active version of the devices and a group that gets a true placebo version of the devices where it turns on, light comes on, but no signal comes out. I mean, that's the way we design it. Um, and so then we monitor both groups to see what's happening over time. So by definition, the device is safe to use with any types of pain medication or any types of uh, pharmacologics that you're using. Um, since uh, you've gotten FDA and CE mark um, for the products, um, mm -hmm. what have you done a post-marketing uh, survey, so to speak, from physicians or patients groups in terms of what the effects they're seeing or benefits they're getting? Absolutely, Greg. So interestingly, 
Um, this product has been marketed outside the U.S. for many years, well, a couple of years before it got approved for by the U.S. FDA. So this product was cleared for full body post-operative and musculoskeletal pain only about a year and a half ago. Um, and so before that, we were in the U.K. for many years. So we've actually um, published a lot of uh, research on how does this benefit patients, let's say seven days into using it, 30 days into using it, and six months into using it. And we've done detailed uh, studies for uh, up to six months on about 15,000 patients, essentially, as a post-market, real-world kind of a clinical follow-up. And the results have been overwhelming. I mean, the general rule of thumb is about two out of three users experience what we call a therapeutic benefit. And in those that experience those benefit, the pain relief is almost always 60% or more. I mean, there's no such thing called a magic bullet. I mean, but the mechanism of action leads us to believe that this should work for a reasonable number of people, a large majority of people. And in those that it does work for, it works really, really well. Um, and more recently in the US, we've actually partnered up with a number of commercial partners and it's been sold um, on Amazon, uh, CVS, um, Walgreens, things of that nature. And the customer feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. You mentioned the distribution aspect of it. Uh, Recovery RX, I think, is prescription only. That's correct. Um, how how do patients find it? Are is there a good awareness in the physician community regarding uh, getting a prescription for that particular product? Well, Greg, if we did have a great penetration, I wouldn't be here talking to you right now, right? <laughs> Just kidding. Exactly. Exactly. We, 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 are, we are a small shop. We're, we're a team of 10 people, very passionate about developing the technology, getting it out there. We just don't have the resources to be able to scale it up at that level. Um, so what we've done is we've partnered up with a sales launch team uh, called Medi Launch, and what they do is they they use their channel of salespeople to who have a good relationships with physicians and surgeons to just push the message out there. Um, so yes, there's a number of groups uh, internationally. Uh, one group specifically in Australia that's been really integrating this into part of their multimodal kits. And surgeons who use this really love it. I mean, it's it's part of their education. For example, they go through the whole post-operative thing, they bandage it, and then they place the device on top and then just wrap it up. So that, that's that's the way that they've been using it. In, in, in this post-COVID environment, hopefully it's post-COVID now at mm -hmm. this at this juncture, uh, a lot of disruptions, obviously, in elective procedures over the past year, year and a half. Um, are you seeing a good uptake then, uh, internationally at least, in terms of uh, Recovery Rx's, you know, sell-through rate? Absolutely, Greg. Um, and the reason being, let's just say the pent-up demand, right? Pent-up demand to have these elective procedures. And obviously, emergency pr procedures have all, all, always been happening. Uh, but one interesting aspect of this, there's a huge demand for, uh, a rather huge interest for this product in um, um, plastic surgeries, in, in aesthetic type of cosmetic procedures. The reason being... Uh, an enhanced risk of recovery early on leads to a lower risk of developing a scar or a blemish, things of that nature. And this kind of aids in that in that environment. Um, but I think overall, there's been a general consensus in the community that pharmacological interventions have their place. They're very important, but they alone can't do the job. And and I think that's become the message is getting louder. Um, one thing that, that's always interested me about um, any kind of device is whether or not it can be worn in the shower, say, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you said you can wrap these things up and you put them on your knees or other parts of your body. But, you know, is it waterproof, water resistant? Do you have to take it off, put it back on? How does that work? Um, it is water resistant, Greg. Uh, if you ask our engineer, he'll tell you it's waterproof. But I, we can't claim waterproof because we haven't done the extensive testing on it. And what I mean by that is so the device is rated for IP22. So if you're in the shower or if it rains or if you go running, you're, you're fine. If you dip your toes in the pool, you're fine. The reason we can't claim waterproof is if you go for a swim with it, right, or take a bath right. with it, the added pressure of the water might be sufficient to get some insight. Even in that case, it's not going to electrocute you. You just don't want a device that doesn't work anymore. Um, so, But that's how we encourage people to use it is to use it as part of an active lifestyle. So let's say you're going golfing, right, and you are somebody who's prone to having um, low back pain or a knee issue after golfing. So some of our clients, what they do is they use it as a prophylactic, put it on, go on, enjoy the game, and they don't have the usual challenges that they do the next day. So we've seen people do it that way. Oh, interesting. Now, you mentioned this, uh, I think, uh, a couple of times in terms of distribution through Amazon and other uh, key partners. Is that how you actually can buy the product, the ActiPatch product? Is it actually part of, a say, a back brace or something along those lines just to, to modify the the pain behavior while you're out golfing or whatever you're doing? Yes, Greg. So it's available in multiple uh, methods. So in the U.S., we've stopped distributing ActiPatch ourselves. 
just okay. because we've been partnering up. So there's two companies that do the large scale. One is called Donjoy. They're the manufacturers of uh, bracing and such. So what they've been doing is they've introduced two products. They call the back EME product and the knee EME product. What they do is they use our flagship device and they sell a custom bracing that they developed. Those you can buy on their website or Amazon, um, but it's designed to be used as part of an active passive type of a combination therapy uh, to hold the knee in place and such. That's more of for the persistent pain category and things of that nature. The other company we've partnered with is, some, is, is an uh, agent called KT Tape. Uh, you may recognize them as the company that has all those colorful sports tape for volleyball athletes, tennis players, and things of that nature. And so they've launched a custom branded version of their device called KT Wave. Um, that's available on um, Amazon, CVS, and I know they're trying to get it into some big retailers like Walmart. But this whole launch happened about six less than six months ago, and so far it's been really, really well. Um, I, I, I'm pretty sure that given the fact that I'm not athletic, um, that wearing one of my <laughs> bags will not help my golf swing any. Um, but, but do you find people util utilizing this for sports, as you mentioned, prophylactically, um, constantly or just once in a while? Or how do, how do people operate with this now, at least generally speaking? Right. So uh, there's two categories of users, Greg, as I like to call it. The, the first category is those with persistent pain, right? The people with uh, persistent knee osteoarthritis, persistent uh, low back pain. And these are individuals for whom surgery may not be an option for various reasons. And the goal isn't to keep the pain or uh, heal the underlying condition, but is to raise those pain tolerance thresholds, as I said, and get them back to functionality. So we see that clientele. And then there's the clientele that I like to call weekend warriors, right? Um, and, and the, and the, the semi uh, athletes uh, who would like to be like the wannabe athletes like myself, but a lot of us have these repetitive injuries, right? Uh, wrist injuries, shoulder injuries, knee injuries, and what we find is at least me, what I find is that the device is incredibly beneficial when used as part of your post-activity recovery regimen. So let's say you're a volleyball player and you have knee pain, which I am, uh, and I use the device on my knee and go to sleep, and it isn't as sore or stiff as it would normally be. That's that's the way I manifest, uh, see see it as being working. That sounds great. Very informative. Um, I appreciate the uh, the presentation again. Uh, thank you for your answers to my questions. Um, that's all I have at the present time. Uh, I appreciate it indeed. Um, hope to have you back again soon. Absolutely, Greg. Thank you so much, Greg. I appreciate the opportunity to showcase our platform and technology, and I really hope this will uh, impress and excite a couple of people who you will be showing this to, and we'd love to team up. Thank you for joining us for this NobleCon online investor event presentation brought to you by Channel Check and Noble Capital Markets. Visit our YouTube channel for more video content, including interviews, virtual roadshows, and conference presentation replays. New content is added regularly, so subscribe below to stay up to date. Visit ChannelCheck.com or click the link in the description to access equity research, news, and advanced market data on this and the 6,000 other small and micro cap companies listed.